All right, tonight I'm very ha happy to welcome Jerome Hershey and Robert Troxell. <laughs> I've known both of these artists for quite a while, and uh, they both live and work in Pennsylvania. Um, Jerry Hershey. Uh, years ago when I met him and saw his work, I knew he was a master of color interaction. And since that time, he has only become more masterful. So I hope you will, I don't know what he's going to say in his talk, but I hope you will ask him about that. Uh, Jerry has a studio in Lancaster, and as far as I can tell, he works every day, all day. He is extremely prolific and successful as an artist. Um, he has a BFA from Tyler School of Art, and he's exhibited his paintings throughout the United States. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I was saying to Bob a few minutes ago, I, I don't generally speak about my work. I just generally do it and uh, allow it to speak for itself. But in a situation like this, uh, I'm happy to talk about it, and I'm happy to try to explain what I'm doing. Uh, some of you, probably all of you, realize that all the little lines in these paintings are words. They're the words that are in the title. <clears throat> so, in this painting, this is the word perseverance, and the title of the painting is perseverance. It's one of my favorite words. It's, it's a word that I think... Uh, it's a word that I try to live by, and in, in terms of my work, it has a wonderful flow. So what I'm trying to do with these paintings is create a certain kind of flow that is beautiful and also relates to the word itself. So what is perseverance? Perseverance is going through situations that are difficult and continuing to go. So you'll see there's a graduation of color and there's lines and lines of strokes that are built up. These two paintings, <clears throat> the oldest things I have here, have a kind of a mandala-like quality, and there's a reason for that. And a lot of these paintings have a mandala-like quality, because I think that the best kind of a work process has to do with creating a personal meditation. And I try to create, in every, my everyday work and in our life, uh, a positive meditation. So I typically use words that are positive. I use phrases and quotes that are positive. <clears throat> and because of the process that I'm utilizing, I'm repeating that word or phrase over and over and over. And this is a six-line Gandhi quote. It starts, your beliefs become your thoughts, and it ends up, your values become your destiny. So a lot of the work in this show has to do with destiny. That one over there is the word kismet. Also, another word for destiny. These grid paintings, the, that painting, this one, and the blue one, <clears throat> are Eleanor Roosevelt. What could we accomplish if we knew we could not fail? What could we accomplish? Problem solving. Every time we try to do a problem, we break it into solvable units. So in this group, which I did seven paintings, and that, that's the seventh one, everyone utilized a grid of some kind different kinds in all, each one, uh, if we could not fail. So there's a sense of positive accomplishment. So there's bright colors, happiness, uh, again, the graduation. But still, you see all the little lines are <coughs> that quote. What could we accomplish if we knew we could not fail? These circular paintings that have the brushwork in them, towards the end of 2014, it occurred to my, I, I listened to my wife, like a lot of us should or do, and we decided that the work needed to have more hand. Now I like, I like to create a certain amount of hand in the under in the ground with brushwork or other kinds of uh, use of materials, but it, it occurred to me that I wanted to come up with a certain <coughs> kind of brush stroke that was compelling and felt like it was original or at least individual. And so I set about doing a large group of very small studies, and I included five of them over here. Uh, and eventually the studies became more and more involved, larger, more interesting, at least to me. And I felt like 
it, it was time to include a word of some kind. And I was just having a good time doing it. I didn't really, uh, you know, there, it wasn't like I was doing them necessarily to include a word or not. It just seemed like uh, but they, it came point that there was a point where they needed to have something else to make them go to the next step. And I thought of a lot of words that I might use, and none of them seemed to work. And I, I just felt like I was having a good time when I was playing. And I take so much of this so seriously. I, I tend to. It seemed like a good time to introduce something that wasn't a word or a phrase or something that was a little bit more playful. So I used the word playing without a, without a question mark and put it around the border of the first two and I called them playing around because the word was going around. And that's what all these are. These are all, this one is the most difficult to see, but they're all layers and layers of brush strokes. And then the crisp lines are the word playing with a question mark going around a geometric shape. Uh, as far as color is concerned, I come out of a geometric color tradition. Uh, when I got out of school in 1972, I had, I had studied color interaction with Richard Kramer at Tyler in Philadelphia. And I spent several years independently studying uh, Albert's color problems. And then I spent a uh, summer at Lake Placid, at Lake Placid Workshop in 75, uh, which the thing that was really pivotal about that summer was that we would work, it was 24 hours, seven days a week studios, we would work all night and then watch the sun rise over the lake. And the, it was kids that were all like, uh, they were all killer kids from all over the country. And uh, the energy there was just tremendous, and that's the kind of energy that I try to maintain in my work and in my daily practice. Destiny, destiny, no escaping destiny. That's from Young Frankenstein. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take questions when Bob is finished, I think, right? Well, no, well, I, 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 no. Do you have anything, can you say anything about the colors, like when you're choosing colors and when you're... I mean, uh, I, the color is very subjective. I, I'll, I'll do a blue painting or a painting that, that, I, that I feel like I'm in a certain uh, something's going on, I'll do that, and then I'll do something in reaction to that. Or I'll try to pick the best of what it is and do, the, do that. The color that's the most immediate is in the little studies because I, I'm working on a bunch of those at one time, and I can finish a couple in one day sometimes. These are, are a little different because I, I do plan them out, uh, but I'm not, I'm not thinking about color interaction as much as I'm just thinking about what, what kind of situation <coughs> would be best to solve the problem. So I did a painting called, I'm getting bugged driving up and down the same old strip, I gotta find a new place where the kids are hip, and it, around painting. So I wanted it to have sun, sand, surf, and asphalt. So I, I use some sand in the paint to create a pretty surface and the painting, the under, under painting was sprayed with blues and yellows and grays and then the, the words picked up all those colors and went up and down because it was going up and down the same old strip. So that's, that's the way it works. It's, it's starting with an idea of a, a word or a quote that's compelling and makes sense with what I'm trying to get across, and then trying to solve the problem. What is the best way to work with that? And the color that I'm using is, is I'm just trying to solve the problem. There's, there's great, one of my favorite movies. Well, I listen to movies a lot. I listen to music a lot when I work, but I listen to movies a lot. I don't watch movies when I work, I just listen to movies. And uh, early on when I was doing the tondos, the circular paintings, I was listening to a brother where now art thou the Coen Brothers movie a lot. And so I did seven or eight paintings that are damn were in a tight spot. <laughs> and then I did a large painting that has very um, kind of organic, uh, I guess you'd say shapes like organ, organic organ type shapes. And that, that's uh, it's a full that looks for logic in the chambers of the human heart. And I did some metallic ones, some metallic circles that are, uh, it, uh, do not seek the treasure from the uh, movie theater when he whispers, do not seek the treasure. 
You, you saw the movie. You're only one of the few ones. Kids, it's a great movie. You love it. <laughs> then, uh, it's supposed to be based on the Odyssey, but I don't know how much of that's true. Then, and the other side of it is, like uh, the Clint, Clint Eastwood movie, Unforgiven is one of my favorite cowboy movies, partially because there's a sense of realism and a sense of the, real, the realization of the acts that are committed. And so when I'm not feeling real optimistic and I'm not feeling real happy, I have a whole list of other paintings that I think I might do. <laughs> and at the end of that movie, when Clint Eastwood walks into the, the uh, Morgan Freeman has been killed and he's going to avenge his murder and he walks into the, the bar and there's thunder and lightning, the first thing he says is, anybody know? This could be a great brown painting. <laughs> Who's the fellow owns this shithole? <laughs> <laughs> my, wife, my wife says, oh, do Maya Angelou. <laughs> Other question? Uh, I do have one question about this pair. Uh, just because your, your grid is different on, on this one, or at least the, um, the background shape. You're changing around uh, the, the sizes of your... So what, what inspired that compared to... Yeah, they, it's just going one from one to the next, and the early ones were just blocks, and then I did a smaller version that was similar to this. Then I did this one, <clears throat> then I did this one, and then I did this one, and this is this just becomes a problem of. And these are identical, but just different colors. You got that? I mean, it's exactly the same. The space and the the placement of the words exactly the same. But it's, it's, I've never done a grid like this. I just wanted to see how it would, how it would operate and how, what kind of a spatial uh, situation it would create. And you know, as far as spatial situation, this is one of the best ones I've ever tried to do. So I'm happy with the way it worked out. But the idea was to create a kind of implied narrative with the same exact visual vocabulary, but change the colors. So this, you know, I could do ten of them; they'd all be the same, but with different colors. How much do you rely on the airbrush? <clears throat> well, I use, a, I use a spray gun when I need to get certain things, like a ground that's graduated like that would be sprayed, and those are obviously sprayed. <coughs> but I, I don't use it. I, I varnish with an air gun too, with a spray gun too, but. Uh, yeah, there's because there's a couple of these grid paintings here. There's there's a couple of spray paintings, but I don't I don't do that much spray. Although I have a terrific OSHA approved spray area. <laughs> OSHA approved like that. <laughs> it's about Louis and I built it. It's about this big. <laughs> Not like you guys in Columbia though. Thank you. Thank you. Our next artist is uh, Robert Troxel. Um, and he is an artist Come here, Bob. in the uh, true Renaissance tradition. He does a lot of different things. He's a master printmaker as well as a ceramic artist. Uh, he was a lecturer at the Barnes Foundation. He taught courses in Jindijing, China, and he was a full uh, professor of studio arts for many years. He retired recently, and he's now co-owner of the Susquehanna Center for Creative Arts, and his partner is here, and he can tell you more about that if you're interested. Um, and recently, he acted in two short films. <laughs> Bob has an MFA from the University of Delaware and a PhD from Penn State. Welcome. Thanks. That's hard to tell. I have to say, like, there was uh, several of my colleagues from School 33 here. I was a uh, part of the first group in that. There's George and Katie and Leonard. They were all, like, they were 30, 30 years ago, I guess. It was a long time. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we're still here as artists, you know, basically. Um, what do you want to know? Ask them. I don't know. What do you want to know? Well, somebody asked me today why some of the things are 
are glazed, like with the celadon, and why some of the things are painted? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> you know, these are more traditional, uh, you know, Japanese and Chinese glazes here. And sometimes, you know, the, the imagery interferes with the, um, the color. You know, they compete with each other. Sometimes they work together, sometimes they don't. Um, a lot of this work is autobiographical. It's about, you know, life experiences. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a sense of whimsy in it, I would say. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, from childhood memories and, um, you know, places I've been, you know, places my wife and I, Elizabeth, have been, and I, I too listen to her. Yeah, like Jerry does. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like this, uh, this piece over here, it's uh, about my mother, you know, and uh, she was a dragon lady, and if you know anybody else is um, familiar with that term, you know, it's like, you know, she pushes you out there and she makes you want to succeed. Um, this is a, um, a celadon glaze on this. I think it's pretty elegant, actually, and it's uh, about one of my friends who went off to you know, med school. Um, you know, some of the other pieces, uh, like the, uh, there's a doghouse, uh, called teapot, and it looks like a transmission from a uh, 1955 Chevy, you know, they were very small in Quebec. I, I grew up, I was um, pretty much involved with uh, technical things, um, I worked in a foundry, I worked uh, as a truck mechanic, and I worked my way through school basically like many of us had to back then before there were grants and, you know, scholarships and stuff. So, but, you know, I uh, took all that in, I internalized it. And these are the uh, forms I came out with, basically. Um, I started my career as, a, well, my college career, um, <clears throat> drinking pretty much. And then I went into industrial arts, industrial art design. And then I went into fine arts. You know, um, I, I like the expressive um, aspect of the fine arts versus the, you know, industrial arts where you were producing for a client, as it were. But you still do a lot of that. Yeah, right. We still, you know, uh, make work. Um, a lot of this work was, uh, not this work, but similar work was uh, wholesale. Uh, my wife and I had a business in Philly, and we would do uh, production ceramics for uh, the Guggenheim Museum shop, the LA Museum of Contemporary Art, um, Neiman Marcus, etc. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it was not as playful or as colorful because, of course, you know, yeah, the constraints of time when you're doing production work. But, you know, we started out and, um, you know, thought we could do this. And, you know, we actually did make a living doing it like Jerry does. Uh, Jerome, I'm sorry, makes uh, his work. And it's a tough gig, but, you know, you can do it. You know, if you're at all interested, if you're a young artist and you're thinking about how do I make it, you can make it. You just have to, you know, approach it and work day to day as, as you are, as I used to do. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's supposed to be a sense of whimsy in these. I have a relative, uh, well, two, who were potters, German potters, and uh, their works in the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, by um, Henry and Samuel Troxel. And uh, <clears throat> if you go and you see it, it's, uh, you know, German scripts, graffito, and uh, they had a great sense of humor for being, you know, um, <clears throat> in that time, uh, and uh, one of the places if loving would hurt, the maidens would complain. You know, and that's, you know, and that sort of uh, wraps, it, wraps it up. You know, I think that you have to have a, you know, a mighty sense of humor, you know, to, to go through the difficult times. Um, what about Heidegger? Heidegger, oh yeah. Well, you know, Heidegger talks about illusion and perception. And uh, one of my pieces over there is called Lighthouse. And uh, yeah, the little piece there. And it's about, it ha it's about um, a lighthouse, you know, that's a symbol of it. But the actual concept is that the horizon is the imaginary line between the earth and the sky that really doesn't exist, but everybody thinks it exists, you know, which is sort of cool. You know, so it's, you know, your perception is lying to you all the time. Um, you know, some of these other pieces are informed, like there's a piece out in the hallway, and that's um, based on Tatnell's Tower. Tatnell was a... Russian constructivist, artist, sculptor, and he made this atomic clock, you know, that never had an atomic clock, but that was the intention of it. So I put a little, you know, uh, fantasy twist on that. Uh, some of these pieces are more anthropomorphic than not. Uh, like this piece here. This is about my son, 
and it's a box, you know, and uh, you know you can just see them like a little guy, you know, like make these little muscles and stuff. So I try to you know animate some of these pieces. Um, this piece, you know, I just start working with templates and stuff, and I make these things out of cardboard first. And uh, when I was a young guy, I wanted to learn how to ice skate, so I threw a rope across a creek and fell in, of course, when I pulled myself across. But this is the uh, front of the uh, skate. There's a skate right there. You know, and on this side, you can see the, uh, you know, the line. So these things evolve when I'm working. I don't sit out with a, per se, idea that I want to communicate. But, you know, as I'm working and reflecting on it back and forth, you know, they take on meaning, um, you know, from, uh, you know, memory or perhaps, you know, something I want to project into. Um, yeah. And then my bigger pieces here, um, <clears throat> they're, you know, symbolic. It's like a cosmic tuning fork, a piece of it. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, just like trying to keep pulse with the universe. And, uh, you know, this is not TV. That's uh, based on a Arthur Street thing. This is not a pipe uh, by uh, Foucault. Uh, a book about uh, by Magritte, right? And then Foucault wrote the book. So, um, you know, there's a lot of levels of, I guess, intentionality and discovery in these pieces. But I try to keep them, you know, humorous and whimsical all the time. Hey, how are you? Um, any other questions? Was, were these houses a series of thought? Did you have a tea house and a dog house and a white house? I'm not sure what that is over there. Well, it's like, um, it's like, you know, Carl Jung talks about the house as a metaphor for being, you know, getting back to Heidegger. And, uh, you know, some of these um, are very specific about my uh, experience in the world. Like, I came over from Japan uh, after the war, right? So, uh, tea house, this is, uh, my mother cleaned out, our mother cleaned out a, uh, uh, an old chicken coop. You know, and then she would meditate in there. And coincidentally, there was a, uh, a cherry tree that was arched over the tea house. You know, so this is sort of a configuration of a chicken to me. You know, and um, I, you know, I, I studied psychology for a while before I went for my master's in art. And um, I think some of that stuff stays with you. You know, I try to get away from it, but it, it comes out, unfortunately. Interesting perception. Yeah. I had a totally different perception. Oh, did you? you yeah, oh, yeah. What was your perception? Well, I just I saw the fan at the top as instead of like a cherry tree, although that yeah. there's a certain tie there to yeah. as a fan as representative yeah. of the yeah, right. of Asian background and, and sure. it just the, the whole thing had motion to me. The whole yeah. piece had motion to me. Yeah. So I saw this maybe something resembling an automobile or some type of a vehicle, sure. but yeah. then it is a vehicle. Yeah. It is, yeah, it was, yeah. And then, um, yeah, you know, so um, these are uh, just part of my work. I, I also make prints, which are pretty, um, they're really moody and black and intense, don't you think? Yeah, and they're very different than these. I mean, in my printmaking, you know, it's like scratching through layers of uh, existence, and it has a lot of storm and drang and a lot of angst. I try to... I think this is what balances me. These these pieces balance that other part of my personality. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, you can say that if you want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, any other questions? No. What's the biggest influence, art movement, or another artist? Well, it would be you, Milt. Know. <laughs> yeah, Milt makes some mechanical sculptures. Yeah. Um, I think I like the Memphis work a lot, you know, from the 1980s. And I actually was in a magazine with Peter Shire, who was a L.A. based um, guy from the Memphis group. And um, I guess that's why they put us together. But yeah, I like the Memphis design because it was making fun of, uh, you know, a lot of modern movements and stuff and putting it together. Yeah, so, you know, I like that We were doing the Memphis design before it became fashionable again. Now. I did? I, how, what? Now, it's very fashionable. Yeah. Design. Yeah, I know. You see it, so you were doing it. 
I was, and, and there was a statement behind it too. Yeah. It wasn't just like a, you know, yeah. postmodern way to put stuff together. You know, like the AT and T Tower in New York. You know that what do you call the, the thing? Yeah. Top, the Chippendale top with the you know um, international style skyscraper. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. So uh, yeah, I used to make a lot of work that was just white, and it had like five values of white in it. You know, but. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you get married, you have kids, and, you know, they're goofy. <laughs> <laughs> they, they affect your work. <laughs> I was a very serious, you know, white on white on white on white artist. I mean, I had five values of white. You know, Rothenberg only had one or two. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, George. First time I saw him, he was like this conceptual artist from uh, what was that place? Uh, Alfred, right? Yeah. And he had all these pennies on the table, and you were looking at the combinations and permutations of those things. I, boy, that guy has more fun than I did. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Leonard has his work done at the Baltimore Museum. I mean, Baltimore Aquarium. I'm sorry, same place. You know. <laughs> Fish under water, water under the dam. Okay, well that's it. Great. Okay. Oh, they take time. Let's just shake hands. Take time. Shake. Don't put it in. Okay. Shall I? Shall I get a shot of this? Yeah. Okay. Okay.